For your project one, uh, we are going to be using watercolor paint. So I wanted to start off with a little demo about watercolor paints. Um, so let's just start by looking at what do I have here. I have my piece of paper I'm going to paint on. I've got newspaper because that will help protect my table. Uh, even though watercolor paint is fairly wipeable, sometimes it's just a good habit to use newspaper to put down whenever you're painting or using art supplies. Um, I have got my palettes here. So you'll notice what's going on is that in these little pans are where the paint actually is. Um, so you, if you ordered the pan of paints that I recommended, um, you'll have, those will just be filled for you already. So I have little tubes. I have to fill these myself, um, but yours are already filled. Um, and then these empty spaces, which is where I can mix my paint. Um, so right here and right here. So I have, I have two open because that just gives me more space to mix my paint. Um, the reality is like if you can find a plastic plate, that works great. Or if you want to buy yourself a special little palette, you can do that too. Um, but anything that's um, plastic or metal, uh, you can mix on and it works great. I've got a tub of water, very essential because watercolor needs water. I've got my watercolor brushes. So you want to make sure when you're doing watercolor that you're using soft brushes. Um, so these are nice and soft. I've got kind of a big one that's flat across the top. It is called a flat brush. Actually, this one's called a bright brush because it's a little bit smaller. Flat ones are a little bit longer, but pretty much the same. Um, I've got one that's a little bit rounded atop, across the top that is sometimes called a cat's tongue or a filbert. And then I've got one that is round and skinny. So this will be for details. This will be for covering larger areas and this is for medium stuff. Um, and I find for anything that is kind of not a giant painting, these three brushes are all that I need. And then I've got paper towel here. So paper towel whenever you're painting is important for both cleaning your brushes but also controlling the amount of water you're using and putting on your paper. Okay, so with watercolor paint, um, usually you want to dip your brush in the water and then pick a color. My colors are kind of messy. I've got some bad habits. I'm just going to do some of this. This is cadmium red, kind of a bright orangey red. Usually I like to put it, even if I'm not mixing, I like to put it in a separate place because then I can kind of control the amount of water and control what it looks like before I just dump it straight on my piece of paper. Um, the more you kind of have control over that, the better. So with watercolor paint, you need water to activate the paint. Um, and then basically the more you kind of work it, you get more paint per water. You're going to get brighter, darker colors. If you add more water, it's going to spread out and you're going to kind of get lighter, um, lighter colors. Yeah. So let's look at what this looks like. So that's pretty bright. Let's see what happens if I add more paint to this. I just kind of keep working it. So you can see it's a little bit darker. And then if I add a lot more water, it's lighter. So that's kind of how you control lightness or darkness or brightness, deepness of your colors. Now, let's say I want to actually paint this orange. I don't actually have an orange color of paint, but what I do have is yellow and red, and those mix together nicely to create orange. Um, if you're confused about that, you can look up online like a color wheel and you can see how what colors are next to each other and which ones mix to make, make which ones. But if you'll notice, my brush is red, so if I dip it in my yellow paint, I'm going to make my paint red, which I sort of have done. Again, like I'm a little bit of a messy painter, but it's not good standard, so you can see this paint is a little bit green, but it really should be yellow. But So to prevent that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dip my brush in the water, 
and then I'm gonna clean it off on the paper towel and then re-dip it in the water and come back over here. And again, you just kind of brush, 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 until you get some yellow. And then I'm gonna come back here and mix it in. That's pretty good orange, but I want it maybe a little bit more yellow. So again, you clean it out, go over down here, grab a little bit more water, brush, 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 brush. And voila, I have a beautiful orange paint mixed here. Um, if you know you're gonna be using a lot, you wanna mix up a lot of paint. Um, if you're only needing a little bit, you only need to mix up a little bit of paint. Now here's the fun thing about watercolor. Um, as long as it's wet, you can kind of keep painting things and spread them out and it sort of blends in evenly. You get this beautiful smooth area of paint. But as soon as you let it dry, you get that harsh line. So if I wanted to mix in orange with this red, because the red has dried, I can still see that line below. So the, this is actually a really good thing because sometimes you want to make it smooth so you keep working it while it's wet. Sometimes you want that harsh edge so you let things dry. I'll demonstrate that in my painting when I show you how to do that. Um, but it can just be really fun to play around with how much water, how much paint, etc. So one thing that can be nice if you want to cover a large area and you want it to be smooth, you can actually paint it with water first and then go in, grab your paint, and it just spreads over that area pretty nicely. So this is a classic example of osmosis. It's wet, the paint molecules just kind of want to evenly disperse, um, but they're gonna stop wherever the water stops on that edge. Now, while it's wet, if I wanted to kind of transition to a little ombre, into I'll go back into my red over here I can kind of while it's wet sort of work it in and as long as it's not too wet I'm gonna try and just kind of brush this a little bit if it's not too wet it'll keep that sort of rainbow quality that transition and not just totally blend um, so that can be a fun way, like if you're ever painting a sunset, to kind of blend things. And it's all about keeping it wet if you want to blend. And if you want those sharp details, it's all about letting it dry before you do anything else. One of the best ways to um, just get comfortable with mixing paint, with using the water, um, is to get a piece of paper um, and to just play around just like I've done and I can just keep going like this is a play piece of paper so the more you play the better you're gonna get um, also I find that it can be really helpful um, to have a piece of paper like this or even another one that when you're doing your final um, painting if you ever want to like test like is this too light too dark is this color the right color so you can see Sorry about that. Um, so here's an example uh, that I use for my project. So I'm just kind of like, you can see I'm trying to get lighter, I'm trying to get redder. Um, I'm sort of, exp yeah, experimenting with lightness. These ones kind of like variation on what happens if I mix different colors. Um, so it's just helpful, it can be helpful to have like that, that sort of paper um, on the side while you're painting. Now, if you noticed, I left this brush in here that is in my water tub. That's not a good idea to do for a very long time. So I, if I'm done with that brush, I wanna clean it up and then just kind of lie it flat. Now you can actually see if I go like this, it's not totally clean. So I wanna clean it as good as I can. So usually I, I kind of just rub it against the bottom of the tub and then rub it against the paper towel. 
If you have some dish soap at the end of a painting session, you can use dish soap to clean it out or you can just uh, hold your brush under running water and clean it out real good with your fingernails. That helps. When you're painting watercolor, the more that you paint, the dirtier your water will get. And at a certain point, it'll start to affect the color of the paints. So at that point, you just wanna dump it out and get new water so that you can have clean, bright colors that you're working with. Okay, for your project number one, abstract triptych, um, the first thing you need to do is find a photograph in color that you will want to paint three times. Um, so it helps if you like it. Um, I solved that problem by choosing a picture of my son Joshua. I think he's cute. Um, but also a couple things to look at is, um, normally I usually espouse like simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. But for this project, if you start off with a more complex photo, because we're gonna engage in a process of simplification, it gives you more choices. So what's going on here? I've got Joshua. Um, you notice there's a lot of like dark areas as well as light areas. Um, so I'm looking at the different contrasts uh, for light and dark. I'm also looking at color contrast. We've got this pop of blue against all this orange and then green over here, blue sky, and then these like toys that are all different colors. Uh, I'm also looking for like interesting compositional things. So I've got all these angles of the deck going on. I've got these like really, these kind of interesting shaped leaves and then the shadows that they cast on the stairs. Um, I've got these two kind of swoopy chairs in the background. So there's a lot going on here that I can really play with. So that's why I picked this photo. When I printed it out, I printed it slightly smaller than uh, paper, normal paper size. Um, because we're gonna be painting on six by nine paper. It can be a little bit bigger, or, um, but I wouldn't get too much smaller, I wouldn't get too much bigger, because the reality is um, if you get too much smaller, it's harder to do details. If you get too much bigger, um, it's gonna be hard to do three of these in a row uh, in the next couple weeks. So the first step um, is you're essentially, you're trying to paint this as realistically as possible with the understanding that you have a short amount of time and none of us are per perfect painters. So all painters have to choose how they're gonna simplify. Um, so as you're drawing, you can choose, like maybe I'm not gonna get the perfect trees in the background. Maybe I'll do that tree trunk. Maybe there's sort of a strand of lights here, but it kind of goes by Joshua's head, so I'm just gonna ignore that strand of lights. Um, not gonna worry about the details in the neighbor's house um, or this table over here. Or and maybe I'll include the table, but maybe I won't include something else. I'm not gonna like count the number of rows going back or the number of posts here. So, so those are some of the ways that I'm gonna simplify. Um, basically, the, the challenge to you is paint as realistically as possible. Um, but also simplify where you need to simplify so that you can do this. If you're familiar with a grid technique, you can use that. Um, if not, the first step is to just kind of do your best at very lightly sketching out what you need to sketch out on, on your paper. Um, so I'm gonna sketch out the outline of Joshua. I'm gonna sketch out all these lines. Um, so that I have sort of a guideline to know what to paint for. I don't want to sketch too darkly because that will affect my final painting. Some pencil lines are not a horrible thing, uh, but we don't want like giant amounts of pencil lines. Um, so for example, like with the trees, the details in the trees, I don't need to sketch out all those ones. Like I can kind of just paint it so it looks like it has some texture and the details in all the shadows, like maybe I'll choose what I want and sketch out a couple of those. But those are also things that I can paint in later without having to outline them with my pencil. So here goes.
Okay, so my drawing is not perfect, um, but it's I, it'll get me the painting that I want to get. So again, like, come close, but don't belabor it too much. Now, in trying to get some of these lines sorted out, I made some of them darker than I would like. Um, so I'm just going to lightly rub my eraser kind of over everything where I can still see the lines, um, but they're just not as dark. And when you think it's good, then you get to start painting. So with painting watercolor, you want to paint light colors to dark colors. And the reality is um, you can paint the dark colors over the light colors. So for example, this deck has a lot of different values. It has light areas, it has dark areas, but it's all kind of the same color. So I can paint the whole thing with sort of this lightish orange orangey reddish brown um, and then I can do the dark stuff over that when once it dries um, and I'll be able to get that detail with Joshua um, I'm probably gonna do a light blue on his t-shirt um, and then uh, yeah light brown on his pants kind of we'll just do sort of a light the, the light colors in and then we'll let it dry and do the dark colors later on. So I'm going to get Joshua's skin tone first. Um, now because I made it so wet I actually like have these blobs of water so I need to like really 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 let it take time to dry before I come close back into that area so I'm gonna work on that deck color oops you know what made a mistake I painted over there since that area is gonna be dark I'm not gonna worry about that but I'm gonna try to go back in and rescue that blue area so pay attention you want to make sure to leave the areas that are going to be significantly different colors. So like I'm going to paint around the little toys because my stuff is starting to dry. I want to kind of re-wet it. Okay, so up here, if I paint an area and it's an oops, one thing you can try to do, at a certain point, you know, watercolor is kind of, you're essentially staining the paper, so um, there's some things you can do, there's some things you can't do. But what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna get it wet again, just with regular water, not with paint. And then I'm gonna use a paper towel to kind of lift it off. And the reality is, is if I can lift enough pigment off then I can make it look blue and it's no problem so I just kind of keep attacking it with water and 
that should be enough to paint over it with blue and it not be a big deal. And then again, I'm going to paint this dark so that shouldn't pop out too poorly. All right, so I'm going to work on green for here and here, blue up here, but I actually don't want to do my blue until this dries so that it kind of goes over this evenly and then dark, dark brown for here and here and then gray for here. You'll notice I took the table out. I decided to do that. So I'm rushing through this a little bit because it's a demo. Um, my hope is that you slow down and take a little more time than I am taking with this. You'll notice as I get into more details, I use smaller and smaller brushes and I'm working darker and darker. So now that I'm going to start going over some of these details with darker areas.
So as I keep going, um, I am not expecting any of you to be experts in watercolor paint. Like this is a very brief introduction, but the, the focus of what we're looking on is kind of the sense of like, okay, how do you choose how to simplify? How do you make the space interesting? And how do you create contrast?
Okay, this is not a perfect watercolor painting. Um, and if I had a lot of more time, I would continue to spend time. And, um, you know, if I had been a little bit more careful about leaving time, I would get some of this bleeding, less bleeding going on. Um, but what we're worried about is, okay, is the composition interesting? Did you keep it like close to the realism? Um, that's going on and is there some interesting contrast going on so I really tried to play up the contrast of the light and the dark areas on Joshua and I think that looks interesting um, and I tried to do kind of some of the light and the dark areas in the porch too and the reality is if I might add a little more shading into this to kind of finish it off because some of this area is sort of boring um, it's unused space not that you need to use all space but um, to activate the space a little bit and kind of bring his gaze down onto these toys will help. Um, so give it your best shot. Look at contrast, look at composition, choose the areas that you want to simplify. Do a little bit of simplifying in this first one.